I'd like to thank uh, Philip and Pippa and the, the cruise team for an extraordinarily stimulating conference. I have to say I'm feeling completely mentally overwhelmed um, and slightly incoherent with uh, everything that we've heard and discussed over the last couple of days. The corpora of written materials from the Bronze Age Aegean are embarrassingly small by comparison with contemporary Egypt and Mesopotamia. Nevertheless, our reconstructions of where writing was made and by whom have given rise to the idea that the practice of writing could have been one component in the construction of elite identities and status. In my contribution today, I want to try and unpick the processes that would lead to writing practices being imbued with this kind of significance. So a uh, considerably less dry title for my paper would be, it's all very well to say that writing was a tool in the construction of elite status, but how would this actually work in practice? Uh, a health warning uh, before I start. I wrote my abstract with an extremely rigid set of ideas about what was happening during this period. And I've read and thought myself into a position of complete frustrated uncertainty, which is probably more appropriate from a sort of a, an intellectual uh, point of view and given the limitations of the evidence. But it does mean that this paper is lots of questions and very few answers. I'm also going to use the terms elite and non-elite for simplicity, but elite status is not a binary. It's more like a messy and shifting spectrum. A little background, um, some of which will be familiar from other papers. The Bronze Age started around 3000 BCE. The scattered Neolithic subsistence farming communities expanded into something more complex. There was a wave of destructions at the end of the early Bronze Age on mainland Greece and the Cyclades. During this period of the early Bronze Age, there's very good evidence for the domestic use of seals and sealings on Crete and the mainland. And in some areas, this is at a really surprisingly large scale. The Middle Bronze Age saw the creation of palaces on Crete. During the first palace period, two scripts, Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, used in writing assisted administration. Cretan hieroglyphic went out of use during the second palace period. Linear A usage spread widely, both within and beyond Crete. Life goes on with further destruction horizons into the late Bronze Age, when small states centered on palaces were now found on mainland Greece as well. The third script, Linear B, records an early form of Greek, and that's used initially at Knossos on Crete and then soon after at mainland sites. Then we have a final series of destructions around 1100 BC, and that's the end of Bronze Age. So for each script, the primary material used is raw, unbaked clay, incised or stamped. In the second palace period, there's some evidence for the use of parchment and a small body of non-administrative writing bearing objects. The clay documents were preserved entirely by accident, as, as Thea stated, and this is a point that must be stressed. What we have are random moments of writing practice, which we piece together to construct some kind of uh, overarching narrative, but they are tiny snippets of evidence. Because Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A remain undeciphered, the number of documents is so very small, we rely more heavily, perhaps too heavily, on contextual and material information. And the corollary is that linear B being readable and significantly larger there's always the temptation for teleology and for projecting back clearer aspects of linear B practice onto the very murky earlier periods. So I've chosen three particular points for which the link has been made between writing and elite status. The first is the use of a particular script as part of the identity of a group. 
And this is seen during the first and second Pallas periods with Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, and also in the late Bronze Age with the development of linear B. The distribution of Cretan hieroglyphic and proto-linear A across Crete in the first Pallas period at the top is very striking. Cretan hieroglyphic is found at sites across the north and east of the island and in a small set of sites around Festos in the south where we find seals. Uh, linear A is attested solely at Festos. Ilse Shoup has proposed that writing was taking place within a much broader elite rather than just palatial context and links its use alongside architecture, craft production and imported exotica to the construction of high culture, which elite groups were creating and manipulating as part of building their identity and in factional competition. So Cretan hieroglyphic would be the preserve of the ethnic, regional or factional groups specific to the north and east of Crete, and Linear A would identify a group centred on Festos. The extinction, in inverted commas, of Cretan hieroglyphic at some point in the Second Palace period, and the massive expansion of Linear A, would then represent the social, political, cultural <coughs> or economic domination of the Linear A group. A similar scenario has been proposed for the creation of Linear B from Linear A. So Bennett, Driessen and Langor and others have suggested that this was part of the deliberate manipulation of material culture by a group centred on Knossos in order to refashion their identity in a way that made reference to mainland practices. Greek would have been chosen by the Knossian palace elite to differentiate themselves from other Cretan elite groups, but also to gain access to the newly emergent hierarchies centred on the mainland. Baines and Yoffe's concept of high culture, which Shoup used, is the, I quote, production and consumption of, of aesthetic items under the control and for the benefit of the inner elite of a civilization, including the ruler and the gods. The quality and quantity of information available for Mesopotamia and Egypt, which is their focus, is leagues beyond what there is from the Aegean. But we composite similar concerns on the part of Cretan elites to maintain inequality through the manipulation of order, legitimacy and wealth, as well as the primacy of visual forms of which writing is one. Houston and Inamata's description of classic Maya courts provides further useful comparative elements, with the courts being physical settings enabling and constraining a set of interwoven behaviours, including ways of dressing and eating, that marked out elites as different and worthy of their privilege. An integral part of this is a prestigious language form specific to nobles, we don't know whether Cretan hieroglyphic and Linear A recorded different languages or not, or how widely Greek was spoken on Crete prior to Linear B's creation. But the concept of a high language and attendant language etiquette, as well as a significant deliberate division between script and the vernacular, is something to bear in mind. The second set of evidence is the small group of non-administrative objects from the Second Palace period. The inscribed stone vessels, which are not shown, pin, pins, ring, axes, they stand out for the materials used in their manufacture, as well as their hypothesized purpose, as some kind of statement or display object, an offering, a grave good, and for carrying inscriptions when by far the majority of their class of object do not. The metal objects are already precious. The inscribing process is the last stage in the manufacture of items destined for elite purposes rather than ordinary consumption. So somehow here, adding text to an object which usually does not carry a text distinguishes it from the larger group and as Bennett puts it, comments on it in some way. It adds an extra component of value. 
there's something um, potentially very different and quite complex going on with the stone vessels. Bevan points out that the inscriptions are often quite poorly executed and there's nothing about the material or manufacturing quality of the inscribed vessels themselves to suggest they're the higher value versions. Instead, the primary logic is one of equivalence matching, albeit within what may have been sequential acts of processing or libation, like you can see on the, the fragment there. So contributing a vessel with an inscription could be a way of creating a distinction, perhaps of increasing its ritual status or efficacy, while at the same time at least paying lip service to the ideal of equivalence, as emphasised in the matched libationary contributions. My third point is the possibility that being a scribe was in itself a component of elite identity. So John Bennett again and others have stressed that the Linear B tablet writers were recording economic activities at the highest level, including producing final documents, and as such are potentially elite individuals rather than servants or slaves. And it might be possible to put personal names to two of them. Kyriakides has pushed this in a slightly different direction to suggest that Pylos Stylus 1203, who is the only tablet writer closely associated with perfume manufacture as opposed to orders, might himself have been working hands-on as an unguent boiler. And he has various other suggestions as well. But it's not clear here whether being a scribe is in itself what contributes to one's personal status, or whether you undertake administrative work because that is what is expected of a person at a certain position in the palatial hierarchy. The comparative evidence for scribal status is vast, but it has the same kind of tension in it. So the bureaucratic needs of the Roman Empire created an elaborate hierarchy with considerable upward social mobility, in which men and some women could hold roles <coughs> where their reading and writing skills are combined with legal and administrative knowledge. And the appearance of writing equipment on funerary monuments makes very explicit the link between literacy and official status, and also the personal pride that people took in their, their literate accomplishments. But at the same time, oral <coughs> composition could be prized as an elite occupation with note-taking and copying carried out by <coughs> slaves or freedmen. And there's maybe an underlying ideology of writing as socially inferior because it's associated with the body rather than with the voice. In classic Maya society, where the link between cultural, symbolic and political capital was particularly strong, some members of the courtly elite were scribes and artists. In his review of the data from Aguateca, Inamata points to the relatively common practice of artistic production among the elite and the multiple interwoven identities of scribes and artists. He suggests that these multiple roles didn't derive from their duties as artists' scribes, but rather they were court officials who happened to be scribes as well. These scenarios are far from universally accepted. The scholarly debate rumbles on. This is the most um, academically rigorous slide I have ever constructed. <laughs> um, the scholarly debate rumbles on and it's becoming increasingly entrenched. I don't want to try and challenge or defend any of these points, but to evaluate the evidence that might be underpinning them. Also, just to step outside of my presentation for a moment, um, the issue of whether or not there were mainland Greeks, Aknosos, is that this is not the hill I'm willing to die on. Um, there are other things I'm much more interested in. And when I was constructing my paper, I certainly didn't intend to set this up as a, a sort of an attack on, on Theo's excellent paper yesterday. Although the evidence is patchy, it seems reasonable to say that while their primary use was in administration, Cretan hieroglyphic Linear A and Linear B 
could be indicators of elite status, used to differentiate elite groups from each other or to allow for shades of difference within a group. Because the evidence is patchy, incorporating comparative perspectives can be really valuable for enriching <coughs> and peopling our very varied constructions, particularly when we use periods for which scholars favour thick description. And my examples were chosen arbitrarily based on what I've been reading recently. I also I apologise for, for any crass errors I made in their interpretation. This so far has been about description rather than explanation. And to try and move beyond simple description, we need to have um, a more theoretical approach. So if we go right back to basics, social relations and meaning making are built out of material culture. As Christopher Tilley says, persons make things and things make persons. Social relations are simultaneously relations between material forms Social identity is experienced and enacted in specific contexts and through material concrete points of reference. So material things act, and again I quote Tilly, as key sensuous metaphors of identity, instruments with which to think through and create connections around which people actively construct their identities and worlds. But some of the things that people make are better at constructing particular kinds of social identities than, other, than others. I think it's, it's useful here to bring in ontologies of value. It's not the only model I could have picked, but I'm going to focus on this one. The concept of value is also a social construct and it's specific to the particular <coughs> cultural context in which it occurs. No single factor is by itself a necessary or sufficient condition for its construction. And because it must be constructed and maintained, value is relative and comparative. And this is in essence what creates hierarchies or gradients of value and status. So Papadopoulos and Erton, they differentiate between place, body, object and number values. Although these are thinking tools rather than discrete fixed entities, and they overlap and interact with each other. And body and object value are particularly entangled with personhood and intimately linked with status display and the use of value-loaded objects or commodities. So just working through one aspect, object value. Um, it's intrinsic or embodied in a thing. And here value has been created from the intersection of various qualities to do with the raw and finished materials. Um, the labour, the identity of producers and consumers, and its capacity to accumulate history. An absolutely key component of value creation, and one that bizarrely is rarely tackled in the literature, is that this value must be made explicit to an audience. I'll come on to what the audience might be in a, a moment. But the value constructed for an object or a practice must be broadcast whether through acts of display, acts of restriction, some kind of verbal declaration, however it's done, it must be stated in order for the value to become realized so that people know that thing one must be treated differently and that it's worth more than thing two or has a certain kind of power. Baines and Yoffe are honorable exceptions in this, as are Inamarcha and Coburn, who unpick this issue in their volume on the archaeology of performance. And they point out that all forms of power relation necessitate constant affirmation and maintenance through acts of performance and witnessing. So who is the audience for these performances of, of status construction? Do the elite create spaces and performances that act as focuses for community? Or do they follow an inward-looking strategy of appropriating space or performance for themselves and addressing the rest of society through exclusion? High culture is, in principle, communicative, but <coughs> tends actually to subvert communication between elites and others through this interplay of access and restriction. 
Baines and Yoffe point out that throughout the history of the early state, the majority of people hardly had any alternatives or points of comparison beyond their own societal environment. This makes it extremely difficult, particularly for the non-elite, to evaluate or challenge the statements they're being presented with. Where does writing fit into all of this? Writing systems at their most fundamental level are visual manifestations of established social norms and contracts. If one conceptualizes writing as an embodied, continually responsive skill, rather than just a performed technology, then it's shaped and it's reshaped in partnership with these evolving social norms. Writing can float between, between all of uh, Papadopoulos and Ayrton's value categories, depending on who's using it and where. Very prosaically, it can be a component of object value when it's applied to things. Because it requires learning within communities of practice, there's great potential for restricting access. It can be a component in administration. And you don't need to follow the particularly hardcore Levi Straussian line that the primary function of writing was to facilitate slavery to observe that the use of writing in administration enabled elites to gather and store information about their subjects and support an upwardly mobilizing economy which benefited those at the top of the chain at the expense of those further down. John Morland has written particularly effectively about how people become enmeshed within texts as they participate in bureaucratic activities, even at an extremely small scale. So here is an elaborate, multi-level bureaucratic structure with officials and customs checkpoints and reporting requirements. It's a system which makes use of writing, but only as one component. I suspect that the peasant and his donkeys here would see the machinery of the state rather than the piece of papyrus as the powerful entity. Bringing this back to the Aegean Bronze Age, the distribution of written documents and writing's primary use in administration suggests that, as with other early writing systems, it's something that belongs to the elite sphere. There's nothing even remotely approaching broader popular literacy. The linear A non-administrative objects are the most straightforward to understand. They have identifiable object values and we can make reasonable assumptions about their intended audiences. Differentiation of an individual within a group and degrees of restriction or exclusion are key here. The ability to see the text and handle the object would operate on a sliding scale from the individual who wears or carries it, then to a sort of inner core of attendees, to the procession or the burial or whatever it is, and so on outwards, up to people on the fringes of the event, who might, for example, observe an inscribed stone vessel amongst the jumble of offerings placed in a crevice at a peak sanctuary. The overarching viewers are presumably the gods. It's very significant if the gods can read. It adds a whole new dimension of value to writing practices and one that we don't pay sufficient attention to uh, when we're trying to understand it. I've included on this slide the quality of foreignness. The first examples of writing, the Arcanist script, which is found on seals, appears within the broader context of increased Near Eastern and Egyptian imports or influences in the late pre-palatial. This is very much an instance of globalization, a widespread and deeply rooted practice observed outside of Crete is imported, reinterpreted to meet local needs and merged with pre-existing practices, in this case, seal use. The incorporation and transformation of a new thing are social practices and would present the ideal opportunity for fixing writing as belonging to the elite realm and also for creating its biography. Thinking about performances to create and declare elite group as opposed to individual status, we have two possibilities specifically relating to palatial settings. Firstly, in the temple repositories at Knossos, 
linear A tablets and a ce ceilings and a tablet were deliberately deposited in one of the stone lined cysts along with other symbolically charged objects. And it's been suggested that the collection and deposition of these objects was part of an elaborate ritual. The linear A documents would represent one component of the palace's power. Bennett and others have proposed that particular linear B texts could have been performed as part of the events to which they refer. So the furniture and ritual equipment inventories on these tablets could have been read aloud as the objects were brought out and arranged. And this would potentially make a conceptual link for viewers between writing practice practices and other performed acts within the palace, such as uh, the insertion of living human figures into wall paintings to create tableau. So in both these examples, the established palatial elite has staged an event of much bigger socio-political, economic or ritual relevance, and writing contributes one component. The, uh, the temple repository event could potentially have been very large. There's a suggestion that the faience shells, of which there are 6,000, correspond to the number of attendees. And we don't have the same contextual clues for pylos, but generally our model of interaction between palaces and communities is one of carefully managed grades of physical access, which in themselves create and cement status differences. Now, this is exactly the sort of scenario that could underpin acts of status creation and differentiation in the first palace period using either Cretan hieroglyphic or Linear A, but we simply do not have the evidence. In fact, the bulk of our evidence has no obvious symbolic content or context, and I'm at a, something of a loss to say how, how it might have been working in day-to-day -day usage. If we look at the moments of extreme upheaval, uh, you know, Cretan hieroglyphic going out of use, Linear B taking over from, from Linear A, those would have presented very obvious changes and made very dramatic statements of palatial elite identity. There's also the removal somehow of the right or the ability to use writing from the people who have lost in these scenarios, which was potentially outrageously disruptive and all but invisible to us. How many more minutes have I got? Um, not many, about one. Three. Okay. <laughs> well, I will. Um, I'll. I'll skip over the neo-palatial, and I'll, I'll try and sum up how writing might have have been used in elite status in a more sort of everyday context. If we look at the distribution of documents, together with what we can understand of how they were used. It seems most likely that the documents that people would have seen when they came into contact with elite groups or with palaces would have been ceilings. And ceilings fundamentally do not require the use of writing. So we come up against this question of whether it's writing in itself which is creating value or administrative activity more broadly. In the space given in elite buildings and palaces to agricultural storage, processing installations, the accumulation of crafted objects, they speak to the importance of the production, mobilisation and consumption of produce, goods and labour. And there's presumably a self-reinforcing cycle here in which the superior status of elite groups was made visible in their privileged access to resources. And this status was then leveraged in the ongoing creation and maintenance of relationships of economic obligation. So if members of the Mycenaean elite, for example, were themselves scribes, this could constitute a, a clear internal statement of the value of administrative activity, but also to anyone in the wider territory who was part of these processes and who came into contact with a roaming palatial administrator. All of this economic activity is underpinned by the Cretan hieroglyphic Linear A and Linear B scripts. But as a, a provocative thought experiment, it's worth asking whether the administrative systems could have functioned without the use of writing.
this is not something that I can easily sum up. Um, what I want to point out, which has been uh, something of a, a revelation for me as I, I've written the, the process that, generally speaking, the, the broad brushstroke model of the use of writing to construct elite status works well enough. But looking more deeply at the data and acknowledging how shaky it is has forced me to question the extent to which it's necessary to rely on these kinds of narratives to carry us forward over problematic data. Until I went back to look at the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A documentation from the first palace period, I hadn't properly confronted quite how piecemeal it is and quite how difficult it is to bridge the gap between the overarching theory and the, uh, the data on the ground, as it were. There are three points uh, not unique to this period which could do with further unpicking. The issue of whether it's writing as a practice in itself that's powerful or its use as a tool in administration. Secondly, writing doesn't appear to have been imbued with a power greater than other aspects of elite material culture. So is it right to single it out and separate it from, for example, painted pottery? Thirdly, the presence of an audience is absolutely crucial for enabling these practices to be effective in creating status, but it's very, very hard to identify in the archaeological record. What worries me about the Bronze Age Aegean is that what we're seeing is essentially the material manifestation of a very, very small group of people talking to themselves. Thank you. <laughs>